plotting. Not easy as Secret Lives profiles Billy Butlin. Billy Butlin was the holiday camp king, a legend, complete with rags to riches story. Yet behind the Mr. Happiness image lies a darker character and an untold story. He said to me once, he said, Bert, there's four things in a man's life, woman, money, Ambition and power. <laughs> he was called the Holiday Camp King. He was the greatest showman in the world. He was a most remarkable man. He was a phenomena. His idea was, I'm bigger and better. And so he was. W.E. Billy Butlin, M.B.E. This is your life. <laughs> Throughout his life, Billy Butlin carefully constructed his legend. So much so that in 1959, when he appeared on this extraordinary edition of This Is Your Life, the Red Book surprise was no surprise at all. He was seen as the barefoot boy who rose to honors and mixed with royalty a family man, a friend to the church and charity. But it was a long way from the truth. Are you ready to come? I'll, I'll never trust you again. <laughs> William Butlin was born in 1899 in Cape Town, South Africa. His parents' marriage failed and at the age of six, he was in Britain. To earn a crust, he and his mother returned to the ways of her family, traveling with the traditional fairs, selling gingerbread. After several years on the road, his mother, Bertha, married again, and the new family emigrated to Canada. Underage, Billy Butlin volunteered for World War I. In France, he was a stretcher bearer and bugle boy amidst the horrors. In 1921, he returned to England to seek his fortune on the fairgrounds. But the raggedy kid had help at hand. Relatives gave him a hoopla stall and all the traditional generosity of fairground folk for one of their own. In his autobiography, he says he accidentally made the hoopla too easy. It proved to be good business. He gave away more prizes but took more cash. Well, he doesn't say is that the prizes were just cheap swag. The chocolates he used to give away, uh, I think they were about uh, two or three shillings a gross. She used to buy them from a, a firm that made all this swag. And some of the canaries that, that they used to have to give away were, were dyed wrens. They were dipped in, in uh, yellow dye. And there were more of them dead on the bottom of the cage in the morning. <laughs> He wasn't one move ahead of anybody, I say he was two moves ahead. He's a showman. He was brought up with the boys, learned how to fight and punch and, you know, look after themselves. All showmen are like that. They're a wild bunch. Over the next helter-skelter five years, Butlin moved fast and built up a complete traveling fair all of his own. His employees were often close relatives, but he also had a network of spies and fairground suspicions ran deep. If a ride wasn't uh, moving, these 
people that he employed, what they called G's, they'd get on another ride, and of course others, others would follow. At the same time, they used to watch uh, the take-ins, or, or the, the cashiers, that they weren't fiddling, but he made it almost impossible to fiddle. He put uh, used to put his men in these coats and things and trousers. But I don't believe the trousers, I believe the trousers were, there were no trousers, no, no pockets in the trousers. We all know the reason why, don't we? Billy worked hard, but he played hard too. He met his first wife, Dolly, as he minded one of his stalls. She was one of ten girls, daughters of a Tiverton fish and chip shop owner. She wasn't the only one to catch his eye. When he met Dolly, she was a fiery bugger. And I, th I think that he tried every sister in a way because they were all good lookers. We know that he had an affair with most of them. There wasn't that hardly a sister <laughs> that he'd left unblemished. <laughs> He was a miniature Clark Gable, really. He was, he was attractive, there's no doubt about it. And he couldn't resist uh, an attractive girl. My father said to him, I think you should marry Dolly. You can't go carrying on like this. And I think it was my father's that asked him to marry Dolly. I think it was one of these things that my father was feeling sorry for Dolly. You know, because Billy was away such a lot, we didn't never know where, nobody knew where he went, and never even told his mother. The fair made him plenty of cash. But for a man who loved to bob and weave, it was aptly the dodgems that made him his first fortune. For 2,000 pounds, a huge amount in those days, he snapped up the European rights to this newfangled attraction from America. And for the rest of his life, it said, he took a cut on every ride. Billy Butlin was gaining power and influence, but he was also making dangerous enemies in the fairground jungle. There was a great competition between show people for penny arcades. There was another gang down at the Haymarket. And uh, one night, Bill went with his gang, all carrying cutthroat razors and uh, truncheons, and uh, smashed up the uh, arcade in the Haymarket. He was a man who was always afraid of having retribution. So he carried his uh, open razor, in, his cutthroat razor, I call it, in his top in his top pocket all the time. They were all gangsters, weren't they? Or at least, if they weren't gangsters, they were that type. Barely thirty and awash with cash, Billy Butlin now made a bold move. He stopped traveling with his fare and set up permanent amusement parks at seaside resorts all round England. It was a massive gamble at a time when breaks away for the working man were all but unknown. In 1928, he opened his first park at Skegness on the Lincolnshire coast. He had some spare ground, so he built a zoo. It soon got packed, you see, because it was only a circle. So what he decided to do, he had an old um, opening cut in the side and a turnstile that only worked one way, and a great notice put up to the egress. And everybody, having got round, got us as far as, oh, we go through here for the egress, and of course, egress is naturally exit, isn't it? They used to think they were going to see another animal. And they used to find themselves outside the zoo. 
But if they wanted to go, they have to pay to go in the game. Six years later, Butlin had more than a thousand employees at 20 amusement parks. Most were managed by his inner circle of close relatives, virtually the only people he ever trusted at home. These people were to stay with him as he took his most audacious gamble. The Butlin legend has it that Billy was the inventor and father of the holiday camp. In fact, he pinched the idea. He says that he, he was walking around a, a dull old seaside town and felt sorry for the poor old punters that had paid money and nowhere to go. But Warner had already done it. In fact, there had been holiday camps before, so the idea was not entirely his. Fun and games had been going on at holiday camps for many years. Butlin sent two of his most trusted men to help build Harry Warner's camp in Devon and to learn how it was done. But Warner's was small beer. Billy Butlin had far grander dreams. Tens of thousands, dancing and drinking, all at once, all with him. Comparatively new on the English landscape are groups of barracks-like buildings clustered together here and there along the coastline. But these seaside barracks serve no military purpose. And the armies they house are hundreds of thousands of holidaymakers come to enjoy a new and popular kind of pleasure, the all-in holiday. For as little as 60 shillings per person, one may come to these camps, sleep and eat and live from Saturday to Saturday. <laughs> The Skegness camp opened on Easter Saturday, 1936. Butlin had gambled everything and was virtually bankrupt. The camp had to work. It did. The bookings came flooding in. Cyril Reeve was chief lifeguard and one of only four redcoats that first summer in Skegness. His wife, Joan, was but a schoolgirl on holiday. Every Friday was ladies' night, and uh, uh, men weren't allowed to buy a drink, and of course, us, us four redcoats, oh, yeah. <laughs> us four redcoats, we just get pie-eyed, everybody buying us drinks, oh, oh dear. I, I was, let's say I was never short of a girlfriend. <laughs> Even you fell for me, you see. Fourteen at school, well, oh dear, dear. <laughs> I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> Butlin's genius was in spotting just what people wanted and then providing it. But in the straight-laced thirties, he quickly ran into trouble. Vernon Jenkins was there for those first Radio Butlin early morning calls. Wakey, wakey, campers. Time to get up. Time to get ready for breakfast. And, by the way, go back to your old jellies. A joke, I think which caused a lot of problems with the press. I, I think it did happen. A lot of people did have to change their chalice to go back and get their suit on or whatever. In 1937, the press branded Butlin's a place of easy virtue, where prostitutes plied their trade. Although the accusations came from jealous local hoteliers, the story was a portent of things to come. Good night, campers. See you in the morning. 
<laughs> Good night, campers. I can see you yawning. Drown your sorrows. Bring your bottles back tomorrow. Good night, campers. Good night. That's it. That Got was it. it. Because once you got that fancy car of his, <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it had a rack on the back, and us three girls would just sit on it and used to take us home in the public car sitting on the rack at the back. <laughs> we thought it was great fun. <laughs> Butlin was now moving in very different circles. Town councillors, lords and ladies, and beauty queens were his social world. His wife, Dolly, hated it all and refused to go. Doll was fiery, old-fashioned, wore old-fashioned clothes, didn't want to particularly associate herself with parties and functions, and all necessary for a man of his ambition. She began to get a bit stout, and coming from Tiverton in a little country town, she didn't like balls and, and uh, dinners and dances and things and publicity. And she used to say, oh, Bill, if you must go, take Nora. Nora was also 20 years younger than the still handsome Billy Butlin. To all the world, she was Dolly's youngest sister. In fact, she was the illegitimate child of one of Dolly's other sisters and legally her niece. Nora was a real beauty queen, there's no doubt about it. She was, um, was outstandingly beauty. Bill, he just fell in love with her. Don't really had a feeling that there was something going on. Mind, he was seeing other women as well because he's away all the week and he spent time in London. And I'm sure he used to go around to the red light district because I was told by old George Burroughs that he took him there one night. But um, he decided, they decided that he wanted to leave Doll. Now in his book he says that Doll was drinking, but he drove her to drink and of course the more she drank the more she had to drink and she couldn't even answer the front door in the end without having to have a gin to give her courage to go and see who was there. Nora was already married with one child and carrying her second when Butlin finally decided that she would replace Dolly. Butlin and Nora had two daughters over the next 20 years of what was then considered living in sin. Dolly was never to agree to a divorce. She always had a feeling that this separation or this fascination for, with Nora was just a, a temporary thing. In fact, she always kept his shaving gear, which she took from the house in, in, uh, in Skegness and kept it in her bathroom and took it with her wherever she moved. Family life might be difficult, but business was booming. In 1938, Butlin opened a second camp at Clacton. But his rush to expand with a third centre at Filey was rudely interrupted when Adolf Hitler marched into Poland. That's a family of four. They're over 2,000 feet away. Can you hear them? A shark can. And he can reach them in less than 45 seconds. Discovery Channel. What's really happening? Christmas was coming. Out of the freezing high street shone chocolate heaven. To the man whose head had been spinning with what to buy his wife, it was heaven indeed. Inside, he was spoiled for choice with ways to spoil his loved one. Let's start with a big box of Thornton's Continental, he thought. Thornton's, chocolate heaven since 1911. Well, whatever it was, it just sucked me out of my cab like a whelk. Yeah, and now, this is what you might find hard to grasp. It was the same size as a slimline dishwasher. I put the room inside. Why, you could nearly fit the spare tire from an 18-wheeler in there. Then, 
a voice said, we recommend Finnish double action tablets for Superior Clean. There's a new C9 place setting slimline dishwasher, the appliance of science. <laughs> is Enya. Paint the sky with stars. The best of Enya. If you buy any of Safeway's price-protected products cheaper locally, they'll give you another one free. Free, eh? I <clears throat> wonder what it is. I wouldn't get your hopes up. Safeway. Lightening the load. Eternity. Calvin Klein. Argos has heaps of Christmas gift ideas for a precious mum, for a gorgeous girl, for a talkative aunt, for your prettiest daughter, aren't they all? For your star performer, for the spaced out twins, for your handyman, for your own special spice. Please them all at a price you'll like. Pick up a December copy of Argos Plus now. When you walk the streets, what worries you most? Muggers, drunks, thugs, or meteorites? Up to 18,000 crash through the atmosphere every year and don't stop until they hit something. Discovery Channel. What's really happening? When he first got the idea of opening Skegness in 1936, who really could have conceived that there would be a world war just two short years later and that the government will be screaming out for places to accommodate large numbers of troops. War was to prove a boon for Butlin. His camps were perfect for military training centres. Filey was completed and two more, Adair and Patheli, were built. The army helped him to finish them and the army took them over for the duration of the war and then at the end of the war of course he would be compensated and the camps would be put right for him to such an extent that I believe the boating lake at Filey was in fact a parade ground and at the end of the day there was a small perimeter wall and they simply filled the parade ground with water and it became the camp boating lake. Wheeling and dealing as ever, Butlin negotiated a sweetheart deal with the government, which allowed him to buy back the camps at war's end for a bargain 60% of cost. He took up a senior position with the Ministry of Supply and gained a number of lucrative contracts. By 1945, he was a very rich man honoured with an MBE for his war work. Within days of victory, the tramp of marching soldiers was replaced by a joyous charge of happy holidaymakers. The campers were marching into the camp as the last troop, as the last RAF people were walking out of it. It was changed that quickly. The post-war era was to be Butlin's heyday. Millions of war-weary Britons were desperate for a holiday, and where better than Butlin's? When I joined the company, um, there was a lot of um, XWD crockery, cutlery, and even the um, even the curtains on the chalets were ex-navy. There were large concave mirrors around the coffee bars and the dining rooms. And I was astonished when I asked about these beautiful mirrors to discover that they were in fact searchlight reflectors, reflectors from the searchlights used during the war. Workers were given a week's paid holiday for the first time and the seaside resorts boomed. 
but lynn's camps were overflowing and billy looked to expand at mosny in ireland his nephew vernon jenkins had now become his trusty right hand man when he was building mosny holiday camp he said to me vernon i want you to take this suitcase over and uh, give it to the bank manager locked i wasn't handcuffed but i felt like i was and i guarded it with my life because he said it's very very important so i, I arrived in in dublin stayed the night in the hotel went around with the appointment to the bank manager the uh, following morning and uh, he had a key open open the the suitcase i said what on earth is in there he said oh about half a million pounds uh, now there was an exchange control problem at the time now billy's horizon spread far wider all the way to the caribbean he determined to build a butlins on Grand Bahama Island, complete with hidey high and ho de ho. But it all went horribly wrong. The pound he valued, he was tricked and cheated by the Bahamians, and his racism was forced out into the open. He insisted that all the black men wore white gloves, because he was... <laughs> He was afraid that they would leave black, black fingerprints on the, on the plates. And he made them wear, wear white gloves, too. One of the failures, really, was taking over billiards when the Americans played pool. I believe also that on the menu was the porridge and the Quaker oats and the bacon and egg for breakfast, which wasn't uh, popular with Americans. And I believe also that the camp was built in the path of hurricanes. And I seem to find the happiness I see. The one thing, he, one thing he didn't understand was that the Americans are different than English. They, they wouldn't go in for the knees up, Mother Brown, and Heidi High, and all the rest of it, but he insisted, and that's where it went wrong. Two million pounds of small investors' money was lost, as well as two million of Butlin's own cash. The holiday camp king had lost his Midas touch. He lost a lot of money in the Bahamas, a lot of money. To such an extent at that time, I think that uh, I could hear all sorts of problems going on. I'm living in Dane Court with Nora. She was a great spender, and he didn't like that very much. Butlin and Nora were now living in the lap of luxury in a Hampstead mansion. Close relative and trusted aide Vernon Jenkins lived there too. He had his breakfast in bed every morning, eight o'clock. And if he was in a bad mood, uh, the butler would knock on the door, take the breakfast up on a silver tray for him, and he, he'd shout, leave it outside. But I put it down outside. And the old man would get up and go to the bathroom, he'd kick it over. Why? Don't ask me. But that's the sort of attitude he had about it. After the disaster in the Bahamas, Butlin's answer was to concentrate on his British camps. At their peak, there were nine in total catering for 60,000 happy campers every week. Butlin's personal attention to every last detail became legendary. His sudden camp inspection spread terror amongst the staff. When Butlin came, it was more like a brigadier coming to inspect his troops. Everybody was in fear, knowing he was coming. When he arrived, he would have six or seven management with him, higher echelon from Butlin's. They would all have immaculate suits. The shoes would be shone very, very brightly, polished very highly, 
and they all more or less marched in crocodile style after him around the complex. He never spoke to the sort of lesser mortals, to the staff. He did speak to the management, obviously, but he did speak to the campers. But he was a man to be feared. It did actually look like gangsters arriving in the complex. He walked into the back of a function or whatever was going on. He stood there with half a dozen of the uh, camp managers, the entertainment manager, probably the catering manager, I can't remember who they were, but certainly four or five people. And he stood there, stony-faced, professional, just looking around and see what was going on. And when he'd seen enough, he just nodded and turned around and walked away. And it was a bit like Rod Steiger playing Al Capone. And he just walked and this entourage followed him out. I have to say that I honestly believe that most of those people who were with him were quite frankly terrified that he might find something wrong. The theory was that if you didn't smile, you were not happy. And if you were not happy, the campers were not happy. But Billy Butterton was one of the most serious people you could meet. Yeah, well, they were all scared of him. Everybody was scared of him. They were scared of losing their job, weren't they? It was after the, after the war when it was important to have a job. And uh, Butlin gave them power. That's, that was his trick, not money. Give them power. Give them a title, he said. Call them general manager and they'll do anything. And what is more, they work 18 hours a day, most of it for nothing. Very important. The 20,000 staff were paid a pittance, and Butlin feared many of them were on the fiddling. So, just like in the old days on the fairground, he built up his network of informers. He had his spies everywhere, you know. Oh, bloody Gestapo, they were everywhere. He'd go into all the shops and the bars and watch the fiddles. And there were many fiddles. All the reports would go back to the old man. He had the telex operations throughout all his camps. He used to monitor everything going through his office. He would have families he would give free holidays to, to go down to camps, providing they wrote full reports and return those reports to him in Oxford Street. He also had staff who would come down on spot inspections for two hours. You didn't know they were coming. And the whole thing was like a military operation, I said earlier, but like an intelligence operation as well. He had his pulse on everything. And everybody waited for the fatal day when the telex would come would say, get rid of John, he's no good. And John would be gone within an hour. The Butlin Eye was always on the lookout for fiddles and for girls. Age 50, he spotted 19 year old barmaid Sheila Devine at Patheli. I'd organized a, a press party and I said, Look, I want a dozen girls, the best lookers you've got, put them in red coats and white skirts and have them serve the drinks. Uh, and Sheila was one of them. And all I can remember is the old man coming in, looking at her, and I don't think he probably fell in love with her, there and then. Love at first sight, if you know what I mean. But she was behind the bar, I'm sure she was behind yeah. the bar. Yeah, I can remember she, that, yeah, yeah she Billy was. Butler, yeah. standing there looking at yeah, her, I thought, oh, God, what's going on? <laughs> I can remember that. We just fancied her, that's all. I, mind you, she was a bit young, really. She was a lot younger mm. than he was. Six weeks later, his agent sent me a, a, a key to an apartment, and the old man said to me, uh, give her a job on the reception. So I did. The tangled web of his personal life became even more complex. Still married to Dolly, he'd been living with her niece, Nora, for more than 10 years. Now, he had a mistress, 30 years his junior, installed in a luxury London flat. Nora must have got wind of all this. And Nora said to my wife, I want to have a little chat with you. 
and uh, took her into the bedroom and said to her, uh, do you know that Vernon is keeping a woman in an apartment in South Moulton Street? And of course my wife <laughs> knew, knew the answer to that one. And she said, don't be ridiculous, Nora. She said, don't you know that it's Bill that's keeping a woman in South Moulton Street? And that was what Nora wanted to know. She had it confirmed that it was not me, that it was him. The following morning, Winnie West, his secretary, said he wants to see her. And I thought, oh, God, I'm in it, dear. And he said, that wife of yours has got a big mouth. Get rid of her. And I said, Bill, what are you saying? I'm not going to get rid of my wife. For God's sake, I have children, and I don't want to see her around here again. And from that moment on, him and I drifted apart. Nora started to drink. And then, of course, when she started to drink, he took against her because she used to let him down so slobbering about at bars, you know, with, with other, other men. And um, just one thing went from bad to worse. It was a re repetition of, of doll again, really. Did he ever treat his family right? That's, what, that's the only thing you've got to think of. Did he ever, to any one of them? So, I mean, what kind of man is that? Everything that he touched seemed to uh, go wrong in his private life. To the outside world for the next 10 years, Billy was with Nora. But in reality, as Nora declined into alcoholism, Butlin spent more and more time with Sheila. Do you get an index print that makes it this easy to order reprints? Thought not. What you need is an advanced photo system like Kodak Advantix. It's a different kind of film, a different kind of camera. Together they can help you take better pictures. This Christmas, why not treat someone to a Kodak Advantix gift box? Argos has heaps of Christmas gift ideas. For a precious mum, for a gorgeous girl, for a talkative aunt, for your prettiest daughter, aren't they all? For your star performer, for the spaced out twins, for your handyman, for your own special spice. Please them all at a price you'll like. Pick up a December copy of Argos Plus now. What have we created? Up to 50% longer. gonna live it. Is the world ready for this much energy? New Energizer batteries now last up to 50% longer than before. 150,000? That's many! Andrex are giving away thousands of toys. 150,000? Simply reveal a winning voucher. Yes! Be a winner with special packs of Andrex toilet tissue. The hint of bitter and sweet oranges. The chill of ice on the tongue. coming down in price and so will warm towels 
with sleepy dogs. Piping hot showers and cosy toes. Because next year, British Gas will be offering significantly lower prices to millions of homes. British Gas, the home of energy. Billy Butlin always said that to keep campers happy, he gave them what he desired. His energetic love life was certainly mirrored by many in his red coat empire. Really all the young men, all the young studs used to go down to Butlin's as a red coat and work the season. They'd have a different girl every night. The money was no good, you were not there for the money. You worked 16 hours a day and you worked six days a week. But the one thing it was, it was, there's no getting away from the fact, it was a sexual empire. When I first went there, I complained about the wages. I said, seven pounds, ten shillings a week for all of this. And they said, well, you get your food. Well, I didn't like the food very much, quite honestly. I didn't think too much of the food. But anyway, he said, anyway, you didn't come for the money, did you? And I said, well, what do you mean? I was all, you know, wide-eyed and pretending to be innocent. He said, I know what you're here for. You're here for the girls. Now, in fairness, I was in my early 20s, and uh, I wasn't attached to anybody. And I was partly there for the girls. And... Uh, were successful with the glamorous grandmother that was worth 15 points and if you made it with the general manager's wife that was worth 20 points we walk along hand in hand. and on prize giving each friday all the silver cups were given out to the snooker tournament and the ballroom and all this sort of thing and each week the red coat would get ram's head and that was for being red coat of the week in reality it wasn't it was for being shagger of the week because what would happen would be that he would keep a point system of how many girls he'd had during the week. And the one who had the most girls during the week used to get this ram's head. How did they know? They used to, each night, they used to go back to their quarters and they used to take the knickers from the girls back to the quarters to prove it. At the age of 60, Butlin's complex private life took its strangest twist yet. Dolly, his hapless first wife, died, leaving him free to marry again. But instead of marrying his pregnant lover, Sheila, he chose to marry Nora, from whom he was virtually estranged. He did it to legitimize his children and thus clear away the major hurdle between him and the knighthood he so desperately craved. They came out of Caxton Hall, arm in arm, big smiles. He had settled a lot of money on Nora, so she was happy. Nora was with the boyfriend, and Bill was with Sheila. There was so much animosity between them. They were about to part, and I think they were brought together by one of the newspaper people that uh, arranged things. But even then, I think, on his, on his wedding night, he spent it with somebody else, not, not Nora. On the very night of this sham wedding, Butlin agreed to be the subject of an equally sham, This Is Your Life. Butlin and Nora ended the program playing out the most bizarre of love scenes. So did your bride of today, Nora Butlin.
never trust your wife. <laughs> you can trust me always, darling. Anyway, uh, darling, I'm sorry. I dragged you away from a party. <laughs> but we are going to another one now. I hope so. Right. Yes, with all our friends, aren't we, Eamon? Quite right, Nora, and I haven't... You know, Bill wanted to be Lord Butlin of Skagness. That was his ambition. And really, he thought he was going to get it. W.E. Billy Butlin, MBE. This is your life. I think he wanted to be well known. He wanted to be the man of the town. He wanted to be doing this and he wanted to be... You always noted he did a lot for charity, but Billy Butlin's doing this. Billy Butlin's giving that. And that was what it was for. It wasn't so much the charity. At a holiday camp reunion at the Albert Hall, the Duke of Edinburgh was the guest of the famous Billy Butlin when he received a cheque subscribed by holiday campers for the National Playing Fields Association. Well, Don always said that he was a social climber. She used to say he'll pay any money you, you ask for a ticket just so he can say he views the same uh, lavatory as L Lord Muck. Among people coming away from the palace after the investiture was holiday camp king Billy Butler. Upon him, the Queen had conferred a knighthood. And there to congratulate him... Was In 1964, Billy finally achieved part of his ambition. And he sent for Irene and I to go in the Regency bar to have a drink, to celebrate the fact, you know, with us, at least, being his cousin, that he'd been knighted. And Irene said to him, uh, oh, what do we call you now, uh, Sir Billy, or what? And as quick as a flash, gave the answer. I don't care what you call me, as long as you say I get my right percentage. <laughs> The great irony of the knighthood was that it was awarded for services to the church and charity. Just as sect was increasingly becoming an open selling point for the camps. Bookings were down, and Sir Billy deliberately chased the massive new teenage market. She was to get large numbers of teenage bookings, and they were accommodated in a, an isolated area that was patrolled, and it was called affectionately amongst the staff, it was called Dodge City. But it escalates and it gets out of hand and the boys are saying, oh, it's a right crumpet place and we'll, let's all book in. And parties of 10 and 15 teenagers were booking. And that's when we booked them into Dodge City. Numbers of single boys and girls were carefully matched. Bookings and profits soared. Adverts made it clear what was an offer. The good things that make a holiday are free at Butlin's. The pleasures of the swimming pool. And the smile that greets a newly found friend. The fun and happiness that makes a holiday with a difference. Relaxing. We had an awful lot of single girls used to go there in pairs, without families. And I think in those days, Butlins was the one place you were guaranteed that you were going to get a sexual experience. And I also believe that a lot of the campus went there for that reason. <laughs> There were a lot of waitresses who were prostitutes. A lot of money to be made in a holiday camp of that description. So, yes, you could get laid. That's, you got the attitude that if you went to Butlins, you could get laid. And I think 90% of the time you possibly could. Maybe you have to pay for it. Sir Billy was determined that there should be no Fleet Street expose of either the seamy side of his camps or his private life. His close relationships with editors and journalists meant all remained a closed book. In those days, you could come for the weekend. 
it's very, very noticeable that Dragnet was a sort of uh, higher echelon for Berlin. And used to have these Fleet Street journalists used to come down with the paramours and used to book in for the weekend. And they'd all get terribly drunk. But they were very, very friendly. They used to talk to us all. We used to speak with them. And then on the Monday morning, they used to go home. People wanted to do articles about him personally. He would say, if you want to do this article, I want a copy on my desk before you do any printing so that he took out anything which was he didn't like or was personal and yet he wanted it all the time he wanted his name in every bloody paper Sir Billy now spent less and less time on his business and more and more time hobnobbing with his new showbiz pals He was even made Chief Barker of the Variety Club three times over. But he never lost his fear of public speaking. Some of his films with, uh, <laughs> with some of the torturers. But I don't think there's anything quite to equal sitting down here, waiting for your turn to come to speak. <laughs> Especially when Wellington up here there keeps on looking at you and saying, I shouldn't. <laughs> In 1968, out of the blue, Butlin announced his retirement. He was heading to Jersey in protest at the high level of income tax. The telephone bell rang, I think it was on a Thursday, and asked me if I'd go to London. So I went up to London. I thought I'd done something wrong, actually. And uh, when I got there, he went in the office. And I said, what? Well, uh, well, I'm here. What, what is it? <laughs> I didn't know what you were going to say. He said, I thought I'd like, you'd like to know that I'm, fi I'm going to finish. I'm going to hand the old thing over to Bobby. And I never felt so empty in my life. I don't know why, I had an awful empty feeling. 34-year-old Bobby was not Butlin's real son. He was Nora's second child from her first marriage and had been adopted by Sir Billy. It wasn't the pleasant climate uh, that brought you out here, was it? But the tax position. Really, yes. Uh, you see, I don't I shouldn't mind paying income tax, but I don't want to be able to leave something to my children. Uh, I could have stopped work many years ago, really, if I was just thinking of it myself. But everyone wants to leave something to their kids, and it's very difficult to do that in Britain. In Jersey, Sir Billy chose for the first time truly to become a part of one of his families. Finally, after 28 years, Sir Billy and Sheila married when Nora agreed to a divorce just a year before her death. Sir Billy was 75, Sheila almost 50. See, uh, I didn't have my money left for me. I, I, I started in England. In 1921, with five pounds when I come from Canada, so I've earned it. I started a new business, which perhaps other people may not have started. I think I've played my part to uh, do my share in the welfare of the world. By the late 70s, Butlin's health was failing. Stomach cancer followed a series of heart attacks. And I went down to the hospital at St. Ilias. At, the, at first, they seemed to hold me off. They didn't want me, but I got in anyway. And I found this uh, place where he was, this room. And as I opened the door, there was Lady Sheila, no cameras, no newspapers, no nothing. Just me and Lady Sheila. And she was holding his hand. And I could see then he was very ill.
Sir Billy Butlin died on June 12th, 1980, aged 81. Many of the mourners were from the world of show business, friends who'd helped Sir Billy raise 35 million pounds for charity. The funeral for the fairground storeholder who became a millionaire was the biggest ever seen in Jersey. I'm not, I'm not a soft man, but I, I'm afraid I had to break down. I loved him. Unashamedly, I say that. I've never been back to his grave, and one day I'm going to, I'm going back this summer to have, just to have one more look. In death, as in life, Sir Billy dominates those around him. Early on, he had set out his ambitions, power, wealth, and women. He achieved them all, but it was at great personal cost. Sir Billy Butlin created his own legend, the story of the holiday camp king, Mr. Happiness, the jolly family man who rose to fame and fortune by giving people what he wanted in a smiling fantasy land. Sadly, so much of the tale was just that, fantasy. And Mr. Happiness himself wasn't often happy. Coming yesterday back from Spain, we flew over Jersey and I looked down and there was this island and I said, somewhere down there, there's a big grave that looks like a double bed with poor old Bill laying in it. And as we passed over, I said, goodbye, Bill. Every one of the families that have seen it have all said how much it resembled a double bed. And everybody said, well, that's appropriate. <laughs> Stay right where you are as a new season of Film on 4 gets underway with train spotting in a few minutes. Margot Fontaine, 